Oh, sorry, I was having trouble getting my camera off then. Bear with me, sorry, it's just... See, some people are more prepared than me. So, just to wander through the reports, um, I'll take take it as read. I'll just go through some of the key highlights. Um, so, instant reporting, you'll see, remains within controls. Um, there were, as reported, three prone restraints in that reporting quarter, but all were appropriate clinically and were appropriately followed up at the time. Um, but it's just key that we, we note those. Um, and, and nothing else to comment on in relation to instant reporting and mortality reviews. The Digital Clinical Assurance Group, um, uh, some key notes are around the care notes restoration work that continues, that is really enabling our clinical teams to um, get back on top of waiting lists and some really essential clinical information that, that they've been really waiting for. So that's going really positively. We will have some teams that still need um, ongoing restoration work because of the complexity of the paper information that's been stored over that period of time. Um, EPMA is covered by the Digital Clinical Assurance Group. Um, pleased to announce this is a plan to go live for the end of this month on one ward where we're going to test out um, it in practice. Um, lots of preparation has been made, the clinical team are all ready and we have a go live and not go live decision on Friday. And we've also got a bed management tool introduced for community hospitals, which would, should really assist some of our flow work. As previously mentioned, clinical audit, um, taken a very pragmatic review of the previous year in relation to some of the challenges that have not enabled to um, for some audits to go ahead as planned and really encouraging for the year 23-24. We're just finalising that audit cycle, but really encouraging people to really focus on the must-do audits and the audits that will really enrich and enable our clinical services and patient care um, and be really much stricter and kinder to themselves around their intentions and plans. Um, under complaints, pals and feedback, um, we requested an internal audit which has just come back to us relating to our reopened complaints. We noted that um, there'd been a slight rise and we wanted to check our process around that. Uh, we're just working on the action plan and that will come through to the new Q&S committee as will the restoration plan. As you may recall, there has been a deterioration in the response time of complaints that we're, we're working on. The QIAs are as noted and um, CPAG continues to be a really effective place for QIAs to be brought to and discussed effectively. Um, and just to fi finish on the inspections, as Sarah's mentioned, the Ofsted inspections and the positive outcome um, for the good rating. And for CQC, just to add, um, since the report has been written, we had a follow up, a safe and well CQC inspection on Mortem Award on the 4th of May, which we've received some brief um, written feedback and Hillcrest was visited on Monday of this week and we're awaiting that written feedback um, but no verbal feedback has been given as yet. And that's the summary of the Q&S report. Any questions on, on Q&S there? I just got just a, just a couple if I may Natalie. I make the assumption if there was no on the day feedback from Mortimer and Hillcrest then there shouldn't be anything significant. Yes, yeah, so they are duty bound to inform us of any immediate concerns on the day. They then summarise any any matters they found that they'd like us to attend to within in writing, and then we wait for the full report. So yes, no, no immediate concerns. Thank you. And and in the report, uh, um, you mentioned virtual frailty wards, which I know kicked off uh, two or three months ago. I wondered where in our governance processes are we reporting progress on that? Just remind me if you could, please, so we can see how that's going. Yeah, so that's that will come through the QNS route through integrated governance. So that will come through the, the usual routes. Um, we have got Rob with us. I know Rob's really close to this. If you does want to give us a bit of an update. Yeah, if you could, please, because I know this is a key aspect of what, what gets called across the system as left shift. And if we if we see this type of work as being successful, one can only anticipate it being rolled out in other areas. So um, it was just anticipating how that is going. Yeah, happy to pick up on that, Mark and Natalie. So, uh, as you said, we're running a pilot in Wire Forest currently. 
Um, we've had some discussions over recent weeks, myself and the medical director from the ICB, with region and the national teams. Um, there is a change in some of the definitions around what we include in virtual wards. Our original projection for this year for frailty virtual wards was going to be six beds raising to 12 pretty well as we speak 48 by the end of the year and then raising to 60 by the end of the financial year we are being directed by region to include some in uh, uh, some existing activity that's delivered through neighbourhood teams around our high level intensive support so we're just in the process of modeling that through as that currently stands we've added in another 40 admission prevention beds this is uh, these are services that are currently provided by the neighbourhood teams across the county where people who are at risk of acute hospital admission um, require intensive inter interventions from nursing therapy and medical teams, potentially up to four visits per day to keep them out of hospital whilst they're going through some sort of an acute crisis. And then with regards to sort of occupancy, et cetera, of those 46 beds, we're running at about an occupancy rate of about 72 percent. And our length of stay for virtual wards on those beds is around about nine days on average with patients. Then when they're discharged from the virtual ward component, the majority of those are then stepped down back to routine care via the neighbourhood team. Thanks, Rob, and thanks for the um, reminder. I say reminders to board, which is a euphemism for reminder to me that they're uh, coming through PMB. Um, and if I if I've heard you right, Rob, in essence, region are accepting. Actually, we've been operating virtual wards previously, in essence, then through some of our neighbourhood team work, and they're trying to get us and the ICB to recognise that within our overall figures. Is that is that correct? That's correct, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. indeed. Thank, thank you for that update. It's something we need, we, we keep an eye on and probably seeing more of as as time goes by. Uh, if we can note Natalie's report, then thank you, Natalie, uh, and move to workforce. Elaine. Thanks, Mark. Um, for our newer colleagues, this uh, is an, uh, an overview of some of the detail that uh, Tessa referred to earlier. So I'll take it that uh, colleagues have read the report and this is for information. Um, it covers all of the things that are around our staff experience. So if we go to levels of sickness and appraisal completion, uh, obviously we continue to experience some tension around that and the rates aren't where we, we would want them to be. This is in the wake of recovery from um, COVID and more broadly uh, staff morale. Nonetheless, we're still making this a priority for managers and encouraging them to ensure that conversations around appraisal takes place. It's picking up problems in a more timely manner and being proactive. We're also asking them to be more proactive in their management of sickness, um, particularly where we've had sickness where there has been a period of 28 days or more. We're looking at, um, in the wake of um, COVID, we had set up in 2021 a hub as a system, a health and wellbeing hub. And whilst being particularly welcomed and used by, by colleagues, um, two years in, we find ourselves in a position where we are unsure or probably moving more towards a case of it not being funded any further. Um, as an immediate update, we've, we've now been informed we have monies until the end of August. In the interim, the action that we're taking is to start to close down um, triaging and referrals and looking at an offer that brings together all of our trust initiatives and offer that as a virtual piece to support staff. So we're going to be doing that, um, doing that currently. In regard to staff um, employee relations, our HR team continue to support those teams where there is a degree of frailty and risk and Hillcrest has been mentioned. Uh, we're working with the leadership team there. I think there are wider issues which we're all aware of, which is around the culture piece and how we manage that and support our leaders to, to manage that in a way that is going to be sustainable. Um, we're, we're continuing to work with our leadership team there. 
addressing the workforce challenges in relation to attraction and retention. The overarching piece is around um, looking at what we can do to get people in. And it was really helpful to hear from Carla because one of the things that we have to look at is uh, a much diversity within our workforce and thinking about how we present a, um, a an attractive and compelling piece for those younger, our younger aged uh, workforce to come to our organisation. We're also looking at very bespoke attraction events uh, that are very localised, working with our operational managers. One of the challenges we, we accept is operational challenges where people can't be released versus we need to release people to be out there to talk cogently about the offers that are available. We're working with our operational managers to, to do that. And of course, there is the international recruitment piece that we're, we're working on. There is some hesitancy generally in not just our system, but nationally around international recruitment, uh, the emphasis on uh, what we can do. But it is a not a final um, piece that we can do. It is one of a number of interventions in and amongst the local events that we're going to do is bespoke recruitment events. Uh, we are aware that we have the agency reduction uh, working group that is being led by, by Matthew. We're all feeding into that, certainly from an attraction and retention piece as well. On the retention piece, we're working with our line managers to ensure that those career conversations take place. We're also looking at the design of career pathways, not just for clinical roles, but for those non-clinical roles as well. The feedback we get from staff is that there is feels to be a lack of clarity about the, what the career options or pathways may look like for other staff, and we need to do some work about articulating that uh, more clearly. Looking at the quality of the data around why staff are leaving our organisation is still a work in progress. We've seen some uplift in the quality of, um, and numbers of returns to our exit survey, but also discussions that managers can have in a more preemptive way the minute somebody is, as we might say, getting itchy feet. Uh, what, is, what is it that you need to be talking to them about? So encouraging that that happens sooner rather than later. We're continuing to review that data and refine it. We're looking at other options in terms of attraction and retention around the apprenticeship piece as well. And we're going to be looking at a work program for certainly the next uh, year in those areas where there is the vulnerability around vacancies in relation to clinical roles and non-clinical roles as well. All of these things are captured in our um, action plan. We've taken our people strategy, uh, disassembled that, and we, we call it our valuing our people plan, which is taking the strategy and turning it into an operational plan. And uh, specifically as an update, we recently took, uh, we, we get a lot of rich data from our national staff survey. We took to the last workforce committee uh, an interim plan. We had some feedback on that that has now been uh, strengthened and I think it's a, a later uh, agenda item but just to update that we've we've progressed that probably in advance of our workforce committee in June but I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks Elaine. Uh, Jamie. Thanks Elaine. Uh, an impressive amount of stuff going on. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, appraisal levels. I've raised this at Finance and Performance Committee mm -hmm. as well, because although as the report says the figures are stable, actually they've they seem largely um, to have plateaued since last August. Mm -hmm. And I see in the report uh, that a number of things are being done, including the potential use of group appraisals. Funnily enough, that's something I had quite a lot to do with in my professional career. Uh, and I, we, we found it a very helpful way of dealing with uh, um, the difficulty, the logistical difficulty of having one-to-one uh, -one with employees who are very dispersed and because of the nature of their work, it was uh, quite impractical to arrange. Um, it says here that it's been suggested. Are, are, are we actually doing it, is my question. Yeah, the two, two parts to the answer, Jamie. We uh, are trying to re we're reframing the appraisal paperwork you know we're trying to take a less is more so that's 
currently in place and we're trialling that with a group of managers. On the team appraisals, we recognise that some managers have huge spans of control where broadly the jobs are similar. So what we're encouraging them to do is to provide a frame for them to have a conversation with the team, for example, it says that these are kind of your team objectives, but they're applicable individually. That doesn't negate a conversation around individual issues for staff members. So it's a two pronged approach. A, we're looking at the paperwork to include a team approach, uh, but B, also include a response that addresses particular issues for staff. And it is being progressed. We're trialing it at the moment. Uh, we as recently as this week, in fact, with a group of managers and the feedback has been that they found it particularly helpful. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you, Jamie. Tessa. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on that issue around appraisals, Mark. Um, at the Workforce Committee at the end of April, we had a wonderful member of staff called Eve Manera, who came to talk to us about her experience in the Trust. Um, uh, coming from a black and minority ethnic um, background, but also being part of the Developing Aspirant Leaders programme. And she spoke very articulately about the fact that for a good many years in her career, she thought appraisals was a management tool for the benefit of managers and didn't realise that an appraisal was a two way conversation that was actually about her and her development needs. And I thought it was a very meaningful conversation fortunately her more recent experience of appraisals has been just that it's about her and her development and her potential um so that's good but i think while setting group objectives is great that we mustn't mitigate the need for an individual conversation so that individual members of staff have the opportunity to say I want to stay as a staff nurse forever or I really want to become a sister, a charge nurse and um, uh, an advanced nurse practitioner, whatever it might be. And that we then can have managers who are supporting that development. And I think it's crucial for our bands that are below clinical level. So bands one to four where they're not necessarily clinically qualified and actually progression is much more difficult. So actually having conversations with them individually is really, really important. Yeah. And, and just to respond very quickly, Tessa, that's part of the reframe of the uh, my one to one paperwork. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I've, I've asked that we also provide some sessions for staff preparing to have appraisals and to think about how they want to use the time that they have with their line manager. Thank you, Elaine. Um, if there's no one else, one comment and one question from me. Uh, the comment that revolves around exit surveys, I must admit I was quite surprised as to how low the return rate on that was. So I just encourage anything anything you and your team and the managers across the system can do to uh, encourage that because retention has got to be our one of our main tools in addressing workforce issues, which leads me to the other question, which is around the wellbeing hub. I know that the national funding is being removed and I'm very keen to ensure the messaging is correct on this because I wouldn't want our workforce and indeed the wider workforce across the ICS to think that the well-being provisions are being removed as well. I know across the system and across our trust we are re-providing in different ways yes. yes, and I think the messaging around this is really important because I'd hate to think our staff receive a message that oh, the funding's going, you know, we don't care and there couldn't be yeah. anything more opposite to that. We care very yeah. deeply and we're doing everything we can. So can we ensure the messaging is correct on that? Please, no, and, and it's one of the discussions. We're very mindful, Mark, of the optics on this. Um, and we don't want our staff to receive it as uh, our organisations not being bothered about their health and well-being. It's a key contributor to attract it's a key contributor to retain so we are having discussions about how, one how we message it but also what we offer in the place of the hub as an entity disappearing and a lot of that is around some preventative measures curated content videos all of those sorts of things but we are going to be looking at how do we ensure that we message that appropriately okay thank you elaine uh, vina Thank you. Um, first of all, Elaine, I have to say you have got a mammoth task on your hands. Um, and I, I'm 
I really admire all the work that's going on here. I just wanted to pick up on the retention piece, Mark, that you mentioned there, because um, if this is a significant problem for us, obviously we we need the data, but the piece of data that I'd be really interested to look at is um, the number of people who are leaving us to join an equivalent uh, employer in our region. So naturally people leave because they're relocating or they've decided they just don't want to be in health anymore, all sorts of reasons. But if people are leaving us to join the Acute Trust or another similar organisation locally, we I would really like to understand what those numbers look like and what the reasons are, because that might be an indicator that there's something that we might have been able to do to retain them. Just to Thing to, I'd be really interested in looking at. No, no, thank you, detail. Vina. And and it's one of the questions that is is asked on the exit interview. Um, as I'm, I'm sure you'll appreciate, trying to get people to articulate it honestly, and I say that in inverted commas, <laughs> their reasons for going can be uh, a, a challenge. I've certainly been asked recently to do someone's exit interview, um, which in their mind allowed them to be a little more frank. Um, as it were, uh, sometimes the, the 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 level of candor that's offered in an exit interview is muted a little uh, because we we ask the line manager to do it. We're trying to move away from that, and staff have the opportunity to ask someone else to do that. Uh, anecdotally, and some of the detail that we've got and the, and, and the qualitative uh, data that we have is limited because it's so hard to get it. Is some of those reasons are uh, around career opportunity. Uh, dare I say some of it is about the quality of the relationship that they have with their line manager. Um, so we're looking at what are the sorts of things that we can do to capture that if they're going to another employer or indeed moving within our system, which is probably less common. Sometimes what we've had is people leave the sector altogether. Um, that may be around work-life balance and some of that is about the ability to work flexibly not because they have care responsibilities but because it's a bit of life laundry thinking I just don't want to do it like this anymore uh, and it's the degree to which we're able to be flexible in hearing that and I would say that we've still got some work to do. Thanks Elena. Uh, Tessa? Uh, just to pick up on that, I thought it was a very interesting question from Veena and one that we really should have a look at. But I think there's also a bigger piece of work that I know Elaine is aware of across the ICB, ICS, which is um, the game playing of banding. Uh, we stick very, very strictly to our agenda for change. Um, some of our partners across the system both in our system and on the borders um, gameplay with higher banding to attract staff and that's I think contributes to our loss of staff sometimes they come back because the grass isn't always greener um, but I do think we need to have a look um, system-wide at where those sort of things are happening um, particularly um, in areas that are, if if you like, not specialist areas, and therefore there is a lot of room for manoeuvre. Yeah, and, and just responding very quickly, uh, I'm aware of in the last couple of months, three members of staff who have left our trust and returned. The grass is definitely not greener on the other side. Um, and they've come back and said, oh my goodness, I thought I was making a good move. They've gone to uh, higher banded roles, but they've come back into the say band role that they left the organisation in. So I think there is something about how we, we capture that. But OK, I think I think the strategic message there is one which we all know, which is retention is probably more important than recruitment. You get retention right then recruitment actually falls away uh, with its importance. But uh, I know that Tessa keeps an eye on it through the Workforce Committee, and I think that more richness of knowledge which um and data which i think sarah's put in the, in the chat i think is important on why why individuals are leaving us and indeed why they may even be coming back from what you just said there and but thank thank you ever so much if we could note the workforce report and then move to safer staffing natalie thanks mark um so again for uh, newer members 
information. This is the six monthly safer staffing report. Um, so workforce safeguards in the NHS recommend that every six months we um, fully review our inpatient staffing establishments. So this is our community hospital and our mental health inpatient wards only. And that we use a triangulation of a safer staffing evidence based tool and we use um, the safer care tool and a mental health optimum staffing tool. Um, alongside that, we then hold one to one meetings with ward managers and matrons and use a professional judgment tool um, to look at the output of the establishment data that's come through the tools and, and get a sense check of how accurate that is. And then the tr third tri bit of triangulation is we use quality metrics. So, for example, in community hospitals, we use rate of falls. And um, for inpatient wards, we might use um, we use instance of restraint to gauge whether our staffing establishments are having a negative impact on the quality of care we deliver. So this is this is that report. Um, a part of Elaine's report was our bi-monthly, which is a, a very much faster look at what are our fill rates. So do we have the right numbers of staff on shift and some red flags for any quality indicators? So to summarise both, I'll just, uh, just reiterate that we are successful in filling our shifts. So the people we have, we often most frequently have enough staff on shift. The issue we consistently have at the moment is the amount of temporary staff that we have on a number of our units. Um, so we, we are seeing now that seven out of our 12 community hospital wards have over 50% temporary staff um, on average. And in our mental health inpatient wards, it's six out of eight of those units. Um, to mitigate that, we have for example, in Hillcrest, proactively engaged a specific agency and worked very hard to have block booking. So they become part of the ward team. So they might be temporary staff, but they're regular members of staff. So for consistency and patient care, that's maximised. And we minimise the use of what we call ad hoc shifts. So those people that might not know the unit or the patients, we minimise those as much as possible. The other highlights were for community hospitals we have a particular hotspot at the moment for registered nurse vacancies on cottage ward and for healthcare support workers on cherry ward for our community hospitals vacancies tend to be a lot more spread across both rns and the healthcare support workers and for mental health the vacancies are much more around registered mental health nurses which are um very a rare resource at the moment um nationally so that's the the full details on the report there's a couple of things I wanted to pull out in relation to the community hospitals you'll see that for registered nurses there's been um, a reduction in vacancies in the last year going from 31.76 whole time equivalents to 11.79 that's the lowest RN vacancies been in our community hospitals for four years and the specific impact has been on international recruitment. So we know that it's not without its challenges and people have taken much longer than we anticipated to settle into role. But that is the impact that International Recruitment Programme has had for our staffing levels, which is fantastic. The community hospitals are also engaging um, with a, a new to care project around recruiting healthcare support workers with no care experience. Um, so again, looking to recruit from our, our community um, and offer new career opportunities to there. For the community hospitals, the data is also telling us we do have an, an increase in acuity and dependency. We've identified that specifically related to um, patients' needs in relation to cognitive impairment, delirium and challenges relating to a diagnosis of dementia, um, which I'll come back to later as the other factors we're doing. For mental health, um, as in specifically, it's around registered nurse vacancies, um, and we are really looking at opportunities to improve our uh, uh, student nurse recruitment, our band to five, six development programmes to encourage staff to remain within our inpatient wards. They often leave to progress into band six roles in community and specialist teams due to the restricted number of band six awards. So we're looking to change that skill mix 
and see if we can maximise retention onto those wards. There's a number of workforce actions that we've described in the paper, but I'd like to really draw people's attention to Appendix 5, which was which was new to this report, which was around the specific actions that during those conversations we're having with the teams, yes, obviously attraction and retention is key and bringing new staff in is key, but what else can we do that would affect the staffing establishment and enable them to deliver safer care? Um, and there's just a, a suite of actions we are undertaking both corporately and clinically with the matron team um, to improve patient care with our current staffing establishments. So for example, looking at a delirium pathway um, to help skill up our community hospital staff pathway might be a new skill set required. Um, and those actions will track impact because they should they should improve morale as well as the quality of the care we're delivering. And they are the key factors I wanted to draw out. Thank, thanks, Natalie. Uh, any questions from anybody? Tessa? Mark, I wonder if it's just worth asking Natalie to explain the fact that actually this paper has a level of assurance, I think it was a four, whereas um, the one that came to Workforce Committee was given a level three, and just why there is a, a mismatch there, because they are different reports, but it, for people that are not familiar, I think being clear about why there is that difference would be helpful. Yeah, of course. So the 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 bi-monthly has got a three. It purely focuses on our numbers. So what have we got and how are satisfied are whether the actions around attraction and retention are having an impact on getting us to our funded establishment numbers. The six monthly is a much broader look of quality, other actions that will be having an impact on patient care, staff morale, staff wellbeing at work. So it's a much broader paper. And because of the actions that we were starting to see around that, that Appendix 5, that are locally driven, this is what staff, staff in the ward are telling us will make an impact. We felt that had taken it up to a another level of assurance around understanding those core factors and core key drivers and the actions that will in improve that situation. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, Steve and then Janet. Steve. Uh, thanks, Natalie. Um, really helpful paper. I, I've, I've just got a, a little bit of a, uh, a challenge, I, I guess. Where, where we've got um, high percentage of uh, vacancies, um, Mortimer Ward, for argument's sake, um, I appreciate that we we are finding the replacements, um, and therefore there's a sort of sense that there, in numbers terms, there's a there's a safe uh, level of staffing. But how do we get to the the sort of triangulation point about um, the 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 fact that there needs to be a quality of those staffing? roles um, that if you've got high turnover and individual shifts being filled by a whole range of 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 uh, differing uh, agency members of staff sometimes that in itself can uh, be quite problematical so I, I don't know whether there's more information that we need on assurance behind that to to know that it's in itself it's not creating greater challenges because obviously we have seen that in some of our wards um, that we're aware of so um, yeah a bit of a broad question but is there more assurance we can get no and, and it is a really broad question and thanks for raising it Steve and that's exactly why I really bring to board's attention those teams that are working on above 50 percent temporary staffing because as you said it's that continuity of care that becomes my question around the quality what, what we know is when we have, and, and Hillcrest is, is a really good testing case for this, when we can't short term recruit substantially to those vacancies, when we engage with a, an individual agency, when we work hard with block bookings, when we produce a really good induction pack, when we treat those temporary staff as if they are our own so we we talk to them they are the Hillcrest team they have we don't have a group of bank and agency staff we have a Hillcrest team 
it's now monitoring the impact that's having on the quality of care and getting the feedback from those temporary staff to see do they feel like they belong to the team so they are regularly booked block booked staff for a minimum of three months we're looking at extending it so those gaps that we know with that we found in the past for example a really robust induction package um making agency staff feel like a temporary member of staff not as a, as a team member how how now do we demonstrate with Hillcrest the impact that's having so that we can we, we're trialing the same on Mortimer but it's making sure that we know the impact of that I think it then comes back doesn't it to that much longer term question of for those really wicked issues so the RMN issue on wards how are we addressing that gap and that's a much more medium and long term plan. So I was really pleased that we had our first ICS Nursing Midwifery Academy launch yesterday. Really need to work very hard to, to do those medium and long term workforce plans now around our registrant population and what we'll have available to us in three to five years. We need to start planning now. So it's that longer piece of work as well. OK, uh, I just come back on that, if I may, Mark. Um, I just wondered that as a board that we should see alongside those areas where we have got those um, higher vacancy levels, just some quality of care indicators and perhaps some softer feedback of surveying the patients and their carers in, in a period of time. Just just so that, because um, uh, I, I, it's great to hear what you say, Natalie, on, on you know, getting a team there rather than a group of individuals. Absolutely crucial, I get that. But it's, it's what impact is that having on the quality of the care and can we triangulate, you know, the, 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 um, those metrics in such a way that we can be really assured it's not having an impact on the ground I'm rambling a bit, but you, you, you. I think hopefully you get what I mean. I do. So I'm ha happy to pick that up, Steve. And and part of it is around the quality metrics that are picked up on the, this report. They, to me, are the, they're quite broad. So yes, are they really picking up? So are there different metrics we can look at? Um, but then on the patient experience, we're starting a pilot um, of. Well, we're using onside again, but not the mental health advocates. They're going to be different independent advocates. We're piloting it on Hillcrest and Holtz for them to come in and do general patient experience advocacy work so that we get a, a true advocacy feeling and perspective on what's it like to be a patient here so that we can start to triangulate that from those wards and then it, depending on the success of that, we'll then roll that out if it if it works really well to all of the wards so we get that direct patient experience but from a independent source thank you thank you thanks steve janet uh, yeah yeah just to add to that a little bit to say that we discussed this at, at qns um and i think really recognize the value of the patient experience um and, and what patients are seeing when they are having um agency and temporary members of staff. Uh, my question was going to be about Appendix 5, uh, Natalie, and, and really just to say I think it's a really good idea to be pulling in um, pulling in the recommendations that are coming out and ensuring that they're, they're applicable you know, across the organisation rather than just in the area where they're coming out. But the question was going to be about the, the reliance on the matrons to be to be spearheading this and actually around whether they need any additional training um, or skills in doing this because I recognise it's probably part of their job role but it may be that that they need a bit of additional support to ensure that, that actually we're getting this done in a consistent way. Yeah, thanks Janet. So we are doing a piece of work with our matrons based on the matron handbook. So they have a rolling 12 month development programme now that's focusing on each component of the matrons handbook. So um, they've scoped out their individual development needs that will be met separately, that, but then also through that programme. So we do have some consistent skill set within our matron group and that it's really enabling them to um, focus on the quality aspects of their work and taking out some of their operational responsibility so they absolutely can focus on this um, as their as a as a key component to their, their job.
I'll meet Mark. Thank you. I like to do at least once a meeting. Um, is that Tessa? Did you want to come in again? Or yeah, Tessa. Just a comment, actually. I really like the idea of the matron handbook as a way of developing and supporting our staff, particularly as they come up into a new role in a new band. And just wonder if there is any scope for doing that for people stepping into band seven, team leader, um, in my old fashioned head, sister charge nurse roles, because I do think that commitment to developing them and supporting them into their new roles a means we get good quality staff anyway but also is another hook to keep them with us and not for them to you know jump ship it shows that we're committed to them and their development so I really think it's worth putting some thought into where else that could be used Thanks, Tessa. Yes, so, the, so the, the Matron's Handbook is a national tool, so it's nationally designed and it, it is it, it's really helpful and it helps with that consistency as well. Um, and one of the one of the priorities we talked about yesterday at the Academy was exactly that. So a, a band seven leadership handbook, again, that we could have across the system to look at skill sets. Because, um, again, we don't need to do that on our own at all. That would be a, a really good system piece of work. Thank you. Oh, I just got a couple of points, Natalie. Um, page 154 of diligence, paragraph eight of the report, got some recommendations snuck away. And so uh, I'm, I'm wondering how they relate to, to this report. And I know there's ongoing discussions between money and staffing levels. Um, yes. I, how, how does, what, what do you want done with those, Natalie? Um, so we have initially done the most critical findings from the staff and review and adjusted the establishments already for this year. We're just working through the finer detail of the other recommendations from that report and mapping what is a, is a must do and what is a um would have been nice to do there's some other factors that come into play with this so obviously looking at through the agency reduction program um there's a safer staffing workforce subgroup to that so we're again we're looking at other factors that might impact our requirement on staffing establishments um which might reduce or change the requirements that have come through from those staffing establishment reviews we're also, as that part of that, finalising the a new safer staffing policy, which will give a much more coherent triangulation of when we've done those staffing establishments, what the output is, and then how that recommendation gets fed back and embedded so that we close the loop, because there's a little bit of that loop that's still missing for me in relation to the what do we do when it's all done. So those recommendations, Part, uh, partly been embedded and some are still being worked through and that will be through the agency reduction subgroup. So the, the, they're not recommendations for us today in our board meeting to take, they're just for information that's ongoing work. Uh, th thank you. Um, okay, if I could qu quickly sum up, the last two papers we've had around workforce and staffing obviously closely linked and we spent a lot of time on it because it is our number one priority, isn't it? And it's our number one risk as well. So I think it's right that we've we've delved into this. Um, one of the actions to come out of it was for Natalie and colleagues to consider uh, the um, what's what was Steve was raising was basically triangulation of quality versus temporary staff in essence. And I suspect somewhere between Natalie and Tessa that will lie or whether it goes to Tessa or to um, Janet in, in the uh, quality committee. I'm not sure, but I think it's an important that we do pick that up and try to understand it a bit better going forward. So we'll, we'll take an action on Natalie to uh, to pick that up and work through where it would go. And I very much like your Appendix 5, Natalie, by the way, that, that gives us some tangibles. This is what we need to do and this is how we're going to do it. Uh, I very much welcome that. So if we could note then this report provided on safer staffing and thank you, Natalie, for the explanations there. I think it's a critical piece of our board work. So thank you for that. Uh, and we move then on to Robert and performance and hopefully over the next hour or so we'll pick up some pace. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just draw out a few key themes from the uh, performance report, some of which do cross reference 
reference to points raised uh, earlier and, and this is an opportunity just to provide a little bit more depth on some of those. So the first one of those is the, um, the trust segmentation which um, Sarah referred to in her report and you have a little bit more detail uh, in the in the exec summary of the uh, the performance report. Um, the um, the process for segmentation is um, is developing and it may be slightly different as we move into 23, 24, but essentially it's a process that's being devolved from uh, the NHSE uh, regional team to the ICB. And at the moment they're doing it uh, jointly. Um, what, what we see here is that um, whilst there isn't a strict rule rules base around exactly how uh, the, the overall segmentation is, is drawn together. Um, there are some fairly key components which, which touch across performance, finance and obviously quality of care. And as uh, Sarah noted, the, the overriding factor at the moment is the, uh, the CQC concerns to be raised, particularly in respect of Hillcrest, are, are driving that. Um, I should remind board that segment two is effectively the default position for trust. Segment one was, if I can say, the earned autonomy lighter uh, touch for trust that were, you know, good CQC or above, financially um, meeting their targets and overall delivering well on performance. So um, the, the likelihood is that um, pending the outcome of the, the core services review and well-led uh, report, at that point, there'll be um, a review. Clearly, we still need to maintain the other elements which we've historically performed um, well on. So that's just a little bit more depth around the um, segmentation. Um, it hasn't technically happened yet, but there's a, there's a formal meeting on the 25th of May, which is referred to in the report where uh, those decisions are made and then in due course um, published. Um, just as a reminder, System remains um, as most systems are uh, to be, you know, uh, struggling with a number of um, areas uh, in terms of uh, overall performance. So we, we historically have struggled on urgent care. Um, probably draw in uh, Rob or, or Matthew around this. I think things are um, stabilised somewhat in the past few weeks, and um, the Sturgis report that Sarah referred to earlier is going to be uh, incredibly important as we go uh, into the coming months. There are some actions out of that. Um, I haven't picked up with my colleague Rob uh, in detail, but I think the anticipation is our elements of that will be, uh, in terms of actions, will be um, monitored through finance performance with a with a cross-reference into quality and safety as, as appropriate. So that's a little bit of um, assurance for the board how we'll pick those items up. Um, just in terms of the oversight themes which are in the summary, you'll note we've had overall um, a movement on the, the themes in relation to theme three and theme five, which are largely uh, measured on the, the staff survey on an annual basis. So uh, Tessa and Elena referred to some of the areas, particularly in theme five, where we've got some recovery plans that we are working through, which will, will address that. Clearly, the, um, the, the, the challenge is that the staff survey is an annual um, process. So we, we have to look towards some of the proxy metrics that we might do to, to gauge performance against some of that. And I think, uh, you know, some of the good work that's been done around the, uh, the pulse surveys and the, um, uh, the staff forums and so forth are all areas that we'd be looking to do. I won't attempt to uh, step in and steal uh, the committee's work around um, getting to a recovery plan on those, but those are the sort of things that we'd expect to feature in there. Um, the, the final part then is just to draw that together, that those themes, as I say, if you take them with the theme one, which is around the core performance metrics, we've got the finance one in there, and, that, and those are the ones. Theme two, which is metrics that are indicated that will come in, but with, with no set targets to be um, measured against as yet. That may change for 23-24 when we get the publication of the, the actual framework from NHS England. Um, that all goes together, as I say, as, a, as an aggregate, and there isn't a hard and fast 
um, scoring mechanism, but um, those are the key themes within performance and um, the overall ratings and views of regulators. Final part I was just going to draw out, which is right tucked away at the end of the um, the summary, it's just around the care notes outage. And again, Sarah did refer to it, and I think um, Natalie also referred to. We are at the point where uh, services have now been back on the system, and clearly that's really important for the quality of care. Um, we, we have a process that runs until the end of Q1 to recover and restore all the data we're going to onto the record. Um, and then we, um, we're effectively as good as we're going to be. That, that puts all the important information back on, but um, it, it does mean there will be some elements that are not there. And uh, we will have this um, tapering impact on some of those rolling 12 month metrics, I, I guess, and, and data for, for that period. Um, you would probably expect there will always be a caveat then effectively where we we're comparing some of those broader metrics over that period that we'll just need to remember that we were subject to a, a downtime on our EPR. Um, that is my summary, uh, Chair, and uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Robert. Does anybody have any questions at all? I, I do have one comment to make. Anybody? No? OK, the comment I was going to make is you'll notice in Section 2 there is the, the IC B stroke ICS metrics, because we are obviously part of the system, so you can see them set out there, of which some of them we play a significant part and some a lesser part. But I was going to relate this to the Sturgis report, and I know Sarah and others will have ongoing discussions about how the governance around the Sturgis report works, because it's foreseeable, although not yet decided, that, that we as a board may end up seeing the whole of the recommendations, whether they relate to us or not. So we monitor what's happening in the system and the system monitors. So every part of that um, takes ownership of the whole report. So although there are specific references and recommendation for us in, this, in the report, which obviously we would focus on and try and in fact already um, doing our best to improve, we could easily see at a board or a subcommittee the whole report and recommendations and so we will see ourselves more and more as part of the system and taking an overview of the system. But Sarah and colleagues will have those discussions. And I've already been had very, very initial discussions with with the chair of the ICB um, along those lines. But it's it's something that we may see more of in the future. Jill. It was just on a completely different point, Mark. It was just for our new associate NED colleagues. Um, if they're looking at some of these charts, uh, we are building into the induction um, programme a session on statistical proce process chart methodology and how we do that and what that actually means. So if you are looking at the charts and thinking, goodness, what does that mean? Um, we are having a session on it. Thank, thank, thanks, Jill. And there are some good centrally provided courses actually on the NHS performance uh, and, and how it's measured. Uh, if there's nothing else, can we note Robert's report on performance and then move to finance, Robert? Yeah, thank you again, Chair. So just in terms of finance, I'm, I'm, I wasn't particularly intending to dwell on the, the report you have here, which is the draft month 12 position um, previously referenced. We've uh, uh, delivered a high level of assurance around this with agency being effectively the um, the, the the one area that uh, remains a, an, a uh, you know a significant task for us and as you're all aware is is a key aspect of um, what we need to deliver in 23-24 to make our plan work. Um, the auditors have started their work and we're progressing that through. Um, Martin uh, touched on some of that in his his audit report so um, I think the report is there for note. The, the, the points I just wanted to draw out, uh, Mark, really, are the, the system plan for 23-24. Uh, the revised position was submitted um, it, at the end of um, uh, uh, April as required. Um, we have a system deficit plan currently of um, £19.2 million. Uh, pounds. Um, with uh, with ourselves delivering a 
2.9 million surplus, which was slightly higher than previously reported to board. And that, that was due to some decisions taken by the ICB around effectively holding investments. So for us, um, that, that was around the, the extended uh, opening hours at Pouch um, minor injuries unit, which, which are now being um, held in abeyance for the moment. So um, the the national team have not yet formally responded to that, so um, we're not in a position to, to say whether that's been officially accepted. Clearly, this is a deficit plan, which is which is not compliant with the national planning framework. Um, there are likely to be some additional controls um, that all partners within the system will be subject to, but again, um, that is yet to be uh, determined or, or worked through. Um, and um, there is one other particular requirement that we will need to be working towards, which is um, for the September time uh, as a system, we need to be um, in a position to talk about the, the plan to a um, underlying recurrent break even. Again, um, I'm not in a position to confirm exactly the timescales um, other than to, to say that uh, previously that had been over you know, pre-COVID, a three-year period. So we'll see what, what that looks like. Um, and then clearly the reality for us is we have a, uh, a challenging plan to live for the year ahead, but um, we do have robust uh, arrangements in place. Um, probably the key element in there is around um, delivery of efficiencies, of which agency is a large part. And uh, whilst it's not in the report here, I'm pleased to confirm that the... Um, Month one figures uh, are showing that we're on track against our reduced agency uh, requirements. And uh, Matthew is is leading a, a program board which has um, most of the exec team leading specific work streams on. So uh, th those are probably the key things I'd want to draw out, Mark. Thank you, Robert. Anybody got any questions on Robert's report? OK, well, I'm not going to let Robert's report pass by like he wants to without recognising the fact that we are producing as an organisation over six million surplus into the system. As we said we would 12 months ago, we have now delivered that. And it's the people on this screen, the executives notably, overseen by Steve's committee, but the executives and the team across the whole of the trust and the people that worked with them that have delivered that financial plan in the most challenging of circumstances. And so whether it's personally from me or indeed as a board, we should congratulate Robert, your team and all the executives that have actually delivered this across the whole piece in the most hugely challenging environment. Um, there are not too many trusts around the country that are delivering surpluses into their integrated care system to help and support their, their colleague trusts and providers. And we are one of them in our system. So congratulations to everybody. As much as Robert rightly looks to the looks forward and looks to the difficulties of the future and setting budgets and looking at underlying um, structural deficits and those sort of things, which I know is his role and he, he wants to do. But just for this second, I'd like to congratulate him and all the executives on delivering our budget exactly as predicted and on target. So congratulations and thank you for that to all of you. Now, I'll just give him grief for the rest of the year to deliver for, for, for this year. Oh, the only other thing I was going to mention as well, although we do focus rightly on agency, absolutely rightly, it's worth noting that our agency overspend last year was absolutely contained within our budgets. So it may be an overspend on that line, but we managed to contain it in all other budgets to ensure we continue to deliver that surplus of six million as as predicted so although it's a problem it's it, it's a financial problem and will continue to be so um if we don't contain it which robert's already said in month one we have but the quality issues as alluded to by steve is also the issue but well done all and we'll move on now to the operational update uh, from matthew um thank you chair um for anybody new this is an update on the focus of operations and eprr work um it's it's a report for noting not assurance is to ensure the board are informed of areas of particular activity and have an early sight of any issues. Um, just for note as well, the report was produced probably just slightly over three weeks ago now, so I'll make material updates as required. I'm just drawing the board's attention to um, the RCN industrial action that took place at the end of April. Um, 
in the event only 32 of our nurses came out um, from 980 members um, good planning and strong service level leadership meant that there was no impact on service delivery although some council appointments were not able to be restored and the impact of the industrial action was tempered strongly um, I think by the, uh, the bank holiday and the legal challenge for the strike date mandate as well which meant the Tuesday strikes did not actually go ahead. Um, of note as well, continue strong uh, performance of the urgent and intermediate care offer, providing genuine alternative in, alternatives to inpatient admission and ambulance conveyance to an increasing number of people. Um, the model is now uh, cited by NHS England as an exemplar. Um, so credit to the leadership of the Director of Urgent and Intermediate Care and his team. Um, we also welcome investment into our stroke uh, pathway and community hospital capacity. We have a service plan um, operating now for the transformation of the stroke pathway incrementally as additional staff are secured. Um, we've been successful in securing a new contract for AFAO's dental services in Worcester City, um, joining our, our Redditch service and making excellent use of our newly upgraded facilities and we're recruiting at the moment for additional dentists. Um, I met with Robin Walker MP in his capacity as uh, MP for Worcester City and also chair of the Educational Select Committee to discuss in particular the rising demand for children's autism assessments and the additional staffing that would be required to meet current levels of need. Uh, Mr Walker subsequently met with the ICB Chief Executive Officer um, at this point. However, it does seem unlikely that additional funding will be made available. Um, clinical leads within the service are working up proposals for a greater pro prioritisation in this pathway to allow our capacity to be focused to meet the needs of the children uh, with greatest levels of need. Um, note also um, our success in delivering the plan to eliminate inappropriate out of area placements in mental health acute wards. Um, none now since the beginning of April um, and beds available each day for emissions. Um, works ongoing with clinical operation release to ensure that emission capacity is continuously available up to um, five beds a day being available by July. Um, finally, um, drawing the board's attention to the quality improvement work that's continuing on Hillcrest Ward that's overseen by executive directors and is beginning to bear some tangible fruit. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you for the succinct and important nature of the, the matters you report. Jamie. Thanks, Matthew. Just got a couple of uh, queries on this. One is on the frailty virtual ward. Uh, Elaine and I did a, a visit to Pouch, the hospital at home team, which I think is part of this same initiative. And I'd, we thought it was great. We'd be interested to hear, I'd be interested to hear how and when this is going to be rolled out more systematically across the rest of the county. Um, and the second question was on the additional 900,000 for community stroke pathways, which sounds fantastic. I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what the the nature of the the anomaly or mismatch that this is due, uh, about correcting and, and where the money came from. OK, um, if it's OK, um, Jamie, I'd like to play Rob Cunningham in here because he's been uh, leading on both those initiatives. Thanks, Matthew. So, Jamie, to pick up on your virtual ward query, um, as referenced earlier, the original plan for virtual ward rollout was an initial pilot in Wire Forest with Glades team for six beds. This is Frailty Virtual Ward, increasing in June to 12 beds, a period of, of evaluation, and then the intention to increase the bed capacity to 48 beds for a partial countywide rollout, and then 60 beds by the end of the financial year, total countywide rollout, subject to evaluation, investment, and recruitment against that. 
as I'd referenced earlier also, there's been some discussions with regards to what we need to include in our virtual ward projections. And as part of our operating plan return for this year, we've included an additional 40 admission prevention beds, which is part of the current neighbourhood team activity. That's intensive frailty work, frequent visits, et cetera, et cetera, with the sole purpose of supporting someone within their own home. And without that, they would probably require an hospital admission. I'm working with the service lead next week to model the additional projections through for the for the rest of the year. As I said, 6, 12, uh, 48, 60 with the additional 48 beds that goes up to obviously um, 46, 52, et cetera, et cetera. And there may be additional beds going in there related to our existing activity. With regards to the stroke investment, um, that's uh, part of the financial settlement for, for this year that Robert has agreed and discussed with the ICB financial director. 900k investment and that's to take us from our current 32 commission beds to 40 commissioned inpatient beds we've been running for in the region of the last two years at around 38 inpatient beds what's slightly different about how we're going to use that investment is the service lead is modeling through the workforce against that investment with the intention to recruiting to pathway posts rather than purely a community post or an inpatient post there will be a requirement that that person would work across the whole pathway um, initially in the inpatient area but with the intention of following the patient through etc etc if that proves to be successful we would anticipate that we can start to reduce the bed numbers back down and also look at pathway posts for the whole of the stroke service. Great. Thank you, Rob. And having met, I think, a recently appointed um, nurse that's leading some of that work for you, Rob, um, a long-standing nurse, she's highly motivated and convinced me within about two seconds flat what what a great appointment she is to 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 delivering that that stroke work. Very passionate as as most of our staff are. But it's it's great to see some investment in that area, which I know has been a thorny issue across our 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 um, system for quite a while. Okay, if there's no other questions for uh, Matthew on his operational report, th thank you, Matthew, for that and keep keeping us up to date. Find my place in my agenda. Staff survey and findings, Elaine. Um, the, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, this is an additional paper which has already been to Workforce Committee, and this is um, a more detailed version of it following the feedback that we received. For um, our new members, um, this is our action plan that has a specific relationship with outcomes of our national staff survey and what, what we intend to do over the next uh, 12 months. So within the document you will see those areas highlighted within the staff survey and the detail about what we're going to be doing about it, actions we intend to take with some clear timelines over the next 12 months. Um, I didn't want to say anything more than that. We've identified who the key leads are, but I'm happy to take any questions. And this also links to the uh, recovery plans where there are going to be some other specific recovery plans that will come to the Workforce Committee. But this was, in essence, we've discussed it at Workforce Committee. Here's the action plan. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Janet. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, thank you, Elaine. Um, I really appreciate the extra detail um, because obviously you've put the flesh on the bones of, of what mm -hmm. came to workforce. Um, I was just going to challenge you on the time scales on some of them um, because, you know, we'll, I can't remember what time the staff survey is, but I, I feel it's sort of November time or mm -hmm. it's certainly it's certainly before the before March 2024, but quite a few of the actions are, you know, due to finish in March. So it was just really asking you, um, whether or not you think the, the timescales are challenging enough or whether we can crank it up a bit. 
I'm, I'm happy to take feedback and views from the, the, the gallery. Um, we've had a conversation, certainly as the senior management team in the People Directorate, about the achievability of this. Um, uh, as I say, I'm happy to be challenged on whether or not we need to move this quicker. There are a number of um, avenues into feeding back how we're doing. We have the staff advocate, staff voice advocate group. We're taking soundings and data coming out of the Pulse survey. And some of these pieces of work are things that are underway. So they, they're continuing to develop as we go through the year. So they will be gaining traction. But as I said, I'm happy for colleagues on the gallery to say, you, could, you know, maybe you can do this quicker, but the, the, these are people initiatives. They're dependent on time, will, um, opportunity um, to get them moving. OK, thanks, Elaine. We'll we'll pick that up. Let's let's take the other questions yeah. mm -hmm. or comments and then, then we'll return to that time frame issue. Yeah. Jamie. Fascinating, Elaine. And um, you know, I had a query to you mm -hmm. uh, early on, which you've replied to. But I wasn't entirely clear what the uh, what the report was, whether it was an update of the uh, the strategy, um, and you, you've explained that. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to check when we think about the staff survey results, the, our overall response to this. This is the totality of our response. This is an action plan to deal with all of it, not yes. just yes. the NHS oversight metrics, yeah. or not just no, those no, bits. all of yeah. it. OK, that was all. It, that's all I wanted yes. to check. Thank yeah. you. And conclude, Steve. Thanks, Elaine. Um, my uh, comment, uh, particularly around the the uh, issue about whether the timescales are challenging uh, enough, is is that we we should assure ourselves that the actions, the primary actions that that we've listed out here we believe collectively are going to have the impact that we need them to have um, because the staff survey results will take care of themselves if the primary actions work in 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 the uh, view of our people out there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um I think we we need more robust discussions around the primary actions rather than uh, the timescales because the, the t this is this is not easy to move a a, mm -hmm. a sort of sense in people's minds of how they feel to be working here and whether they're getting all the support etc cetera, etc cetera, that they need that will take time so um what is it about those primary actions we think is going to make the difference? That's what we should have a discussion mm -hmm. uh, around. Not here, Mark. I'm suggesting, but in the right forum would be would be my view. Uh, and before I move yeah. to Vina, just because I had one point to make, but it, it tags on to Steve's actually, which is why I'll cut in before Vina, which is in the actions there. It talks about you said this, we do this. I think we need to see that very, very much highlighted and brought out. And it needs to be brought out almost from now onwards, because I think it's September, isn't it, when the next staff survey it, yeah, it, starts, it, to it starts to come out in September. Yeah. So if we want to start changing the dials on this for the next staff survey, because we've been a bit tardy getting to this point, I, I think, in all yeah. honesty, the timescales and the, the problem has been getting to get this action plan here now. And this is no surprise to Elaine, because I know Elaine's been banging her head against a brick wall as well, because we've had that discussion. Um, but yeah, that you told us this, therefore we did that, needs to start coming out to our staff quite rapidly, actually, now, I think, um, after this meeting to start mapping out the real tangible things we're doing to change the dials for our staff's perceptions. So also linking into Steve's uh, point about the pragmatic things that are changing. Yeah. Uh, Fina. Yes, and so my point is also about uh, specifics in a way. Uh, I really like this action plan, uh, but having gone through it, and I'm, I might be missing the obvious here, I could see where you've linked the primary actions to the themes that have come up in the staff survey. But I can't quite see which actions link to bullying, which, which I know was one of the themes. Have I completely missed that somewhere? 
because you we've dealt with mm. the disconnect with senior leaders, lack of visibility, low morale. I can't I can't see that bullying itself has been uh, specifically addressed, or maybe we're dealing with that separately. Yeah, I don't know. yeah, I, I, yeah I, I, there are a number of initiatives to deal with that through the HR team, but also through Freedom to Speak Up and the champions and so on. How, however, that may there may be a gap there, but I'd need to look at it again in detail, Vina. Thank, thanks, Elaine. And if you could feedback to Vina on that, yes. or when, yep. when it comes out next workforce committee. Yeah, uh, that's, that's fine. Uh, come to John, and then Janet, you still got your hand up. Did you want to come back, Janet, on time scales or anything? No, okay. Uh, John. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering um, whether calling this a national staff survey action plan is probably ca causing confusion. Mm -hmm. in, in my view, uh, we have a people strategy and there's a framework on which our actions will be built on. And what we will be doing is based on the pulse surveys and the national staff survey every year, we will be dynamically amending and updating those actions to reflect how our people feel. So uh, this is a bit of a multi-year plan for me, um, rather than a plan on the on the staff survey, which we have to complete by the time of the mm -hmm, next survey, if mm -hmm, that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think um, I think that's a valid point, John, because this is this augments our valuing our people plan. The specifics of it is that it links to the outcomes of our our staff survey um, and what we're going to do about it. And we're integrating the two together. So I think there's probably something. It may be a semantic issue, but there's probably something about how we. Um, label that. Yes, yeah, so I'll take that on board. Thank you. Uh, and Tess, and then we'll conclude with uh, Sarah. Yeah, I was going to just agree with John, actually. I think it's really important that we have one clear action plan that is pulling everything together so that Workforce Committee is seeing one coherent approach to how we deal with recruitment, retention, um, all of the other out there, bullying, harassment, EDI, mm. all of those things coming together into one place for review and monitoring. So I think that there is something about this is, you know, it is about culture and change and it's going to take time. We need some fast deliverables that start changing things and slowing, you know, drift down. But actually, we need to see it all come as one coherent piece. And Sarah. Thanks. My comment might be similar, actually. It, it was really just a reminder that things like the National Staff Survey are done in September, but we don't get the results published till March. So we shouldn't really be relying on those as the core actions, as Steve's outlined. So if we mm. are clear what the actions are to me, the, the people pulse that we do internally and the national oh, one definitely. should be a bit of a tweaking exercise. Is there anything new? Is there anything different? That means we've got to adjust the plan. But I think we just need to be a bit careful about actions related to the national survey because it's got such a time lag. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Elaine, I'm just I'm just um, going back to the report. Were you looking for agreement of the board to the to the to the yes. uh, plan as set out? Yes. Yes. So can board agree to this plan as set out with the one caveat of Elaine relooking at where the bullying side of it fits into it? And the other caveat is the naming of this as a plan and John's point about whether it, it's not a staff survey plan. It's just a plan for our people, the, yeah. uh, a people area. So with the caveat of those two, Steve, did you wish to comment on that first? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's not so much a caveat to, to, to that, um, but I do think we, uh, I know this is going to happen in workforce, I guess, but because of the nature of, of, uh, of the importance of this, uh, to our delivery of of everything we do, um, I just wondered whether we need to have an, an some kind of assurance session around the actions and whether we think that they're going to move the needle. Not not in the staff survey context. I'm talking about the, the people plan uh, and the way in which that's got to end up being um, the driving force behind getting ultimately the, the metrics moving but we'll find that out at a later stage so uh, that that's all i would say mark is that because uh, i don't know whether they they 
they do what we need them to do, if, if you sort of mean in terms of outcomes? I, I think you're right. This, this sort of feels like a workforce committee thing, Tessa. I'm obviously looking at yourself and, and Elaine to probably have a conversation outside of this meeting as to how workforce committee can take that oversight and challenge as necessary to make sure things are changing and are being put in place as we think they are. So I think it's probably going to be a continuing element of workforce over the next 12 months in relation to monitoring the deliverables and whether the dials are changing. So if I've asked Tessa to pick that up for workforce committee, that'd be useful. OK, with those uh, with those additions, then I think if everybody agrees, we can agree that as a as a plan for whatever it gets termed in the future. Thank you. And thank you, Elaine. And thank you for the team uh, for for uh, pursuing that. Uh, we move next to terms of reference for committees, Jill. Yes, yeah, so this um, paper emanates from um, reviews that the committees have undertaken, which obviously feeds into the later paper as well in terms of looking at our corporate governance. Um, so each of the committees as board committees have reviewed their terms of reference and have made recommendations that are presented here um, in terms of whether they feel that any changes are needed uh, to their terms of reference and that some of them have made uh, minor changes. I have set out, because they are committees of the board, the full terms of reference as appendices, um, but the summary um, is uh, set out on the uh, in the actual report, and I'm asking board to approve these terms of reference. Thank you, Jill. Does anybody have any questions at all about any of the terms of reference, or can we approve them? There's nobody showing. So a couple of thumbs. So we'll take those as noted and approved. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Nice and simple, which takes us on to uh, a statutory report on safeguarding. Natalie. Thank you. So this reports for information and it gives board um, a very detailed overview of the safeguarding um, partnerships um, work over the last 12 months for both Herefordshire and Worcestershire. So it, it is for your um, for your reading and noting and for information today. Thank you, Natalie. It is detailed. We're required to bring it here, but it, it does give a really good uh, indication of all the work that's going on across our two counties because they are slightly different in how they do things as well. Uh, you. Jamie. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I just wanted to ask about the uh, the, uh, the inspection of Herefordshire Children's Services last year, which found the service to be inadequate. And it quotes, you quote from the report saying relationships with partner agencies were underdeveloped. Um, this is in part due to senior manager churn and ineffective multi-agency arrangements. I just wanted to ask, in relation to the trust what was what was behind this conclusion? Are there lessons here for us and our engagement with uh, Herefordshire Children's Partnership? And are there things that we need to do differently? Um, it, it was significantly about their churn of leaders, which wasn't enabling the partnership to gain any sense of direction, control and momentum. Um, so we are we've been clear from the the for a long time about our commitment to attendance. Um, there's a newly appointed lead um, who we are integrated with, who we've met with, and will commit to, to being being as being present. Um, but they have taken some time um, without partners to really reflect on that report and re-establish their priorities and how they move forwards. But they're now back working with us in re-establishing how that will be become effective. Um, and I think the learning for us, as you said, is around when we're working in multi-agency ways, how does how does that affect when you do have a significant turnover of, of leadership who's trying to run and maintain a particular partnership? But actually, from the majority of our trust, we're very, very lucky in our in our senior leaders are very experienced and we don't have a significant turnover. Um, so where we identify gaps, that is something that we need to consider and reflect on. So I suppose the the follow up really, uh, Natalie, is just you, you're you're reassuring us that we're doing all we 
can do to support the, the partnership and the recovery work in Herefordshire? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Natalie. Can we uh, note that report for information? Thank you very much. Jill, we move to board effectiveness. It's quite an important report, this, uh, in relation to ourselves and how we operate as a board. Jill. Yeah, so if I start, I'll start off and hopefully Elaine can come in and um, when we talk more about development, because obviously that's her professional uh, expertise. Um, but it, board will recall that we did have a first sight of the code of governance self-assessment at April and that I received comments from uh, a number of board members. But what I've brought together here are a number of um, different um, mechanisms for us considering how effective we offer, operate as a board. Or, um, so the audit committee, as Martin's already referred to, received um, reports from the principal committees, which uh, is importantly recognising the differential role of audit committee, not only looking at how um, management um, manage um, our system of internal control, but also how, as part of our assurance framework, the committees have an important role in reporting to board about uh, how assured they are about the areas within their portfolios. And as Martin mentioned, um, whilst broadly committees were uh, core in their uh, business and they were working with their work plan and considering whether they needed additional meetings for specific items. The areas that we did identify was in relation to a more consistent adherence to the performance management framework. And we've already seen through, um, for example, Workforce Committee, where they've now started bringing recovery plans and indicating as to whether they're satisfied with what they're receiving and will obviously further augment that process through the year. As part of our annual process and our reporting, um, as part of our annual report, we obviously complete the annual governance statement. Uh, there is a draft on the um, part two agenda because that's going to be published um, slightly later in the year. The annual governance statement is a prescribed review of our corporate governance arrangements and is um, part of the assessment by our external auditors as to whether that represents uh, a true and effective um, position of our organisation given everything else that they assess. We have uh, conducted a self-assessment against the newly issued Code of Governance. So the new Code of Governance for the NHS came out in April and we uh, spent a little time at April development session having a discussion and considering elements of that. There are, the Code of Governance is, represents statutory guidance and uh, organisations have the opportunity to either comply with the standards set out or explain why, if they think there are reasons for deviation um, from what are the best practice standards. And what is presented are the in the first column what the requirements are, the second column sets out where we think we've got evidence and in the third column we've put any comments as to whether uh, we think either we need to undertake additional work or that there are clarifications or that we're considering any deviations. And um, there is just on one uh, on uh, disclosure number four, actually the comment in the third column could be uh, misinterpreted and what uh, I'm saying there is that only one member of the non-executive team meet any of the criteria that are identified in the guidance relating to questions of independence. And so the rest of our non-executive team absolutely meet all of the requirements to demonstrate independence. But we do have um, one member of the team who has obviously been with the trust um, for a longer period of time, which is not in itself saying that um, the individual isn't independent, but that's one thing that we need to consider. Obviously, Steve, um, with his uh, experience with the organisation, um, 
has been with us for a while, although we have a succession plan in place and Steve is, his term of office is st- standing down at the end of July. The other areas that we've identified in terms of the um, assessment, one is about, and we've had some discussions this morning about how we assess and monitor culture. And one of the recommendations is actually that workforce committee should explicitly pick up this issue to take it forward to consider that it's obviously part of the work that's been undertaken as part of the people strategy, but that the assurance on that and consideration as to whether we're being effective uh, should explicitly be addressed at Workforce Committee. We have um, we've identified from this and already started um, actually that we probably need to more effectively evidence the skills of our board members and we have put in place a mechanism where we're bringing together in one place um, the skills, experience and qualifications of all board members in a single document. We've probably undertaken that in a, a less structured way historically and we certainly did it before we uh, undertook our recent round of recruitment to board but actually we're um, bringing that together in, in a structured way. Um, there's an issue about uh, reporting in respect of our wider protected characteristics um, that is received at REM committee. It probably fits in with some of the equality, diversity and inclusion work that uh, Elaine's team's undertaking and how we explicitly report on that as well. And then the other uh, two areas that I, I think uh, just to raise, we've obviously previously discussed the issue about um, Martin as senior independent director, whether it's appropriate for him to chair audit committee. And the view was when we discussed this that we felt whilst an issue is raised in the code of governance that Martin is the most appropriate um, person to undertake the role of senior independent director as well as um, Chair of Audit Committee, um, it should be noted that the role of Senior Independent Director is more limited in an NHS trust compared to a Foundation Trust, where in a Foundation Trust there is a specific role for the Senior Independent Director with respect to governors, which obviously we don't have. Um, And then the final two areas are about the information that's received at board and the papers that are received at board. And I recognise the irony that I'm raising the issue as to whether we should be limiting the length of board papers when the two longest reports on the board agenda this morning are both mine. Um, Not something that I usually do, but the terms of reference and this report are are the longest reports and I recognise that. But we've talked for possibly over the last six months now as to whether we have the focus of our agenda right and we are focusing on our principal areas of risk and bringing the right uh, areas into the public domain, which is always a challenge um, in terms of our transparency uh, on our performance, our quality, our uh, financial position and making sure that uh, we're absolutely open with the public Uh, about that, but also whether we are making the best use of our time at board in terms of bringing together the skills and experience of people on the gallery um, and actually we're using public board appropriately and then using the other time that we have available um, to uh, perhaps sometimes address some of the wicked issues that we do have. Um, One area for um, discussion is whether we should um, be all aspiring to have board papers that are limited to a certain length. Certainly we have some partner organisations who have done this and there are pros and cons to that. And we always, I think, need to recognise that whilst um, we might have a standard that an expectation that board papers are not unduly long, that there may always be occasions when it's necessary and it's entirely appropriate to uh, present uh, longer papers. I don't want everybody just going to you know size six font or something so that you can you can get more into your paper. So I think there is an issue about how we need to emphasize the focus on papers to board are concise 
Um, but it's, it's also important that we're absolutely explicit about what are we asking board to do? What are the risks about that? Or what are the risks of not taking action? And also considering all the elements when we are either making decisions um, or we're not making decisions. And the, the final area um, that I just wanted to identify from the review of the Code of Governance um, is about the um, areas that are uh, currently brought to board and whether we ought to be having another look at, we we changed round the order of some of our reporting, um, I think it was from September, and actually the structure that we have of board agendas now after the patient story and chief exec reports and the BAF and strategic objectives reports is that we bring the committee reports for assurance. Um, one um, suggestion from looking elsewhere is whether actually as part of the committee reports we should also append to those the executive reports I'm not sure um, if it will save us significant time at board because it's obviously important not only to hear from the committees as to how they felt assured and what they felt might need um, further focus or further resource or um, bringing up the priority list, but it's also important to give executives the opportunity to identify issues that we as a unitary board all need to be aware of because whilst these um, reports have been cons considered in a great deal of detail at the committees, we do need to remember that we are a unitary board and not everybody attends obviously all of the committees and yet we are all responsible for the decisions that are made across the whole organisation and so um, one area that uh, uh, making a recommendation is that we consider as to how we order some of our board reporting. I don't think that it fundamentally changes what we bring, but whether actually we just change the order and consider, for example, the quality and safety committee report as well as the executive report um, relating to quality so that the two are, are together. And we obviously need to then reflect that in the time that's presented. Um, in terms of the second part of the report. Um, Jill, Jill, can I suggest we pause there before you go on to the second part of your report? If there are any questions around the, okay. the governance review, any questions for Jill, any points of clarification, and then we'll move on to the, the, the second bit. Does that, I mean, Jill's put, and the team have put a lot of work into this. And as you all know, we're never going to arrive at the perfect place. We just keep striving to get there, I think is probably the what, what we're attempting to do. Does anybody have any questions on what Jill's been through so far, far and the governance review has set out? So can we accept the recommendations as part of that review, please? So that's OK. Well, that was simpler than I thought you're going to get, Jill. So you, you've done OK there. Uh, OK, thank you. Then move on to that second part of your report now, please. So in terms of the second part of the report, obviously in terms of always having reviewed that where we're up to at the moment and considering any amendments to that is actually as to what do we need to put in place for us to constantly improve. Um, we last year, or in the last year did conduct an external well-led review and we also had some further diagnostic work undertaken um, on the back of that and uh, partly as a result of the themes that were identified through that work but also partly as a result of um, looking at how we think we can improve um, some of our um, areas of, of, of practice. We have been having a discussion over a little while about our future board development programme. We've obviously also uh, now brought on board four new associate non-exec directors and there's a number of different elements to any board development programme. This is very much intended to be the, the whole board programme. So sitting alongside this, we obviously have the induction programmes for our new colleagues. We all, as part of our annual appraisal and objective setting, will separately be looking at our individual personal development programmes and that might include professional development as well as 
um, the our role as as members of the board. But what is included here is how we uh, are proposing to put together a plan relating to our whole board development. Um, this has been built on a, a number of different elements as set out in the report. And this is very much the development around how we interact, how we might challenge, how we consider ourselves within the system, how we have a line of sight to governance. Obviously, uh, what we also do and sit slightly separate to this, but will continue is very much the transactional um, development that we bring through the uh, alternate month meeting. So, for example, it might be in June, we always have an annual update on safeguarding and we look at our information governance um, position and those things will continue. And so this isn't just the um, the sole element of board development. This is very much the how we work together, how we're most effective uh, at some of those softer skills, probably the, the softer skills which are often the most difficult to get right. And so if I, perhaps at that point I can hand over to Elaine, who obviously um, has uh, commented quite significantly and uh, developed a lot of this as well, um, in, just in terms of uh, some of the rationale and ethos around that and the activities. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jill. Um, so from, uh, I can't see which page it is on um, diligent, but what I've offered is an overview of what I think would be some helpful um, inputs around our board development. Uh, and I would say that uh, from the onset, this is about bringing together the not inconsiderable skills and expertise that uh, our NEDs have, um, but also um, aligning that to the skills and expertise that we have as executives as well. So I would see that as not just doing transactional pieces, but also transformational pieces. And as Jill mentioned, builds on the well-led review as well as the independent work that Julia Ross did for us uh, in the latter part of last year. So what's offered there are some not absolutely finite. I'm saying these are my suggestions about what we could be doing in response to the data that we have um, currently. But also a good opportunity for our newer colleagues to start to embed themselves in, in the organisation. I'm proposing that we do these on days when we're already timetabled to have board development. I meaning to meaningfully engage in this um, and the suggested topic areas, I don't think we can do it in less than half a day. I think half a day is the minimum. A day would be the maximum. Um, but for issues of pragmatism, my suggestion would be that we still need to take either 0.25 of the day to deal with what I consider to be some of the practical day to day things that we do need to do. I call it the transactional stuff. Uh, in terms of a proposed time frame, my sense is we have something already timetabled in, which by by luck rather than planning, um, happens to fit with some of the things that we feel that we need to look at as a board. And that's around our role as um, system partners, uh, how we work with our partners and some of the skills, but also a reflective piece, because just as much as it can be for those people who are activists, just get out there and do it. I think there's a piece for us to sit back and think about how can I do this? most effectively and what's my my role so it takes taking a very much an experiential approach just draws on our not as i say in considerable expertise as a board and uh, exec they're going to run every other month as uh, jill mentioned um, and cover some uh, specific areas there's a note in there about complementary development activities this by all means is not the whole process. I think there are things that will come along as we continue to explore and develop this further that we think we need to take some time to, to do some more development on. I've suggested in there the, the concept, and it's something that the, the board has done previously. In, in my world, we call them organisational raids. <laughs> They're opportunities to go to other organisations, to go with some really pre- uh, designed questions about what it is we want to make it a focused and useful process to bring that back to ourselves as opportunities to learn to do things differently 
and some of that is captured in uh, some of the proposals that I've put in there, for example, around um, developing an outward mindset. It's something that we've done some work with our SLT on and some of our system partners. It's been very well received and it really is a reflective uh, piece of work, but getting us to think about often we can look outwards, but we probably do less of the looking inwards about what's our role in developing those relationships, working in a different way, turning our ideas on their heads and looking at it through a different lens. So the suggestions in there, a good starting point is around the how do we work as a, a board more effectively, but also as system partners, uh, followed by, for example, insights. Now, colleagues on the gallery may well have done some of this before. General rule of thumb is it's a refresh um, every three years as a, a, a minimum. My, my sense is most people haven't done that in the last couple of years. It's a way, it's not the whole answer, it's a way of looking at how we can play into our preferences, they're called energy preferences, but there are times when we need to flex differently. And how can we do that? And we're in a great position as a, a new board and newer members, but to think about what that means for how we lead the organisation, but how we work with each other. So I think that's one of the early inputs that I would be suggesting. Uh, there is an opportunity for us to begin to meaningfully think about how do we challenge, check and challenge with each other in and out of meetings in a way that is helpful? And sometimes it can feel quite stretching, but the intention is we're moving, uh, all of us are moving in the same direction. There are times when it's going to feel quite tense, but in a way that feels helpful rather than unhelpful. Understanding and embracing risk. I think my sense in the two years I've been here has been a recurring theme and there is an opportunity for us to, I think, meaningfully, and there's going to be some challenge and think about, you know, are, are we risk averse? Are we meaningfully embracing risk? What are the sorts of things that we need to take into account, but discuss that as, as the board? And then looking at um, leading for inclusion, obviously, we know nationally, locally, regionally, within our system, this is a huge issue for the NHS. And I think there is an important role for board to play in, in doing this and having the conversation which says, well, where are we individually? Where are we as a board around this? What's the tone that we need to set as senior leaders within our organisation so that our staff meaningfully feel that. We've started to do some of that through Freedom to Speak Up. Uh, we're doing that through some of the work that Sammy's been leading. Um, but wh where are we as a board on that? You know, are we all starting from the, the same place? As I say, these are indicative um, suggestions. Uh, happy to hear um, other comments, but it is drawing on the well-led review. It's drawing on the work that uh, Julia Ross started to do with us. And as I say, there are going to be other things my sense would be that come along during the next 12 months that we also have to give some uh, attention to. I've added in there what I call indicative content. That's not the whole, that's not the whole piece. Um, these are some essential things that uh, from where I sit, I think it's important that we look at. It's not the whole program. Um, I've got some thoughts about who might help us to facilitate these events because I'm very conscious of I sit in two places, uh, kind of commenting on X, but also going to be a participant. So it's not probably wouldn't be a good idea for me to be facilitating any of, any of this. So I'm currently looking at subject to what we agree today, how we facilitate these events going forward. So I'm happy to take any questions or uh, reflections on what's what's in there thank you thank you elaine and i know this has been a sort of an iterative process over the last 12 18 months mm -hmm. that takes us to here and there's no reason why it shouldn't continue to change as we go forward either so uh, i have uh, janet vena and then john janet uh, yeah yeah thank you um yeah i want to be really supportive of this um i think it looks really good um i like the idea of of actually delivering the content 
um, at our board development days because actually that's what they're called, isn't it? Board development. Um, so I think that's I think that's really positive. Um, but I'm also really pleased to see the complementary development activities in there because I think that what has really helped me um to get to know people and after all i think it's it's actually getting to know each other better so that we trust each other that, that really helps us to be effective and what i found really helpful is doing doing our our visits um jointly with the execs because i think that really helps you to get to know people on a, a much more informal level so I'm, I'm very pleased we've got that um and would think that if we can think of more activities that we can do like that um, that would be very beneficial. And I've also found that, that being on interview panels with people is a really good way of doing it. And there will be other things as well. So I'm very supportive of this. And thank you, Elaine, for pulling it together. Thank you, Janet. Vina. Yeah, I absolutely 100% agree with Janet. Um, I think this programme looks great. And to just to pick up on your point about trust, Janet, um, you know, I. I have to say I'm really relieved that I've joined the board now rather than three years ago because I guess you guys were meeting remotely most of the time um, and whilst it was absolutely necessary um, you know it might not have been as conducive for you know having those qualitative discussions and building relationships and social learning you know we've got so much to learn from each other which in turn builds trust which is probably the key ingredient in making boards effective um so i wondered whether an, uh, an underlying all these development areas that are set out in your in the uh, board development program is a is a principle around psychological safety you know that um that shared belief that you know held by you know a team or a board that it's okay to express our ideas and mm. concerns. It's okay to speak up with questions, uh, to admit mistakes, to take risks sometimes without fear or unfair consequences. I wonder whether that's that's a theme that might we might want to highlight because when you know when we had a look through that code of governance and it runs through all of those recommendations you know the chair should promote a culture of honesty openness trust and debate um you know you should be ensuring constructive relationships between executive and non-executive directors uh, we have a responsibility to constructively challenge you know it runs right the way through that code so i i, I just kind of thought you know it's difficult to achieve those things without having a really strong foundation of psychological safety and I can absolutely see that as a trust we're fully embracing that approach through you know various initiatives such as the freedom to speak up pl platform um, my suggestion is that we need to be actively modeling that behavior as a board as well yeah. Yeah. Um, you know we we we, I guess, we need to be you know, inspired by the the Clara yeah. Caras of this world. You know, she was. Yeah. That's exactly what she said. And although I'm young, I get to ask all of these questions. Um, so yeah, I, I think this, this is going to look. This uh, and I, yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and and uh, thank you, um, Fina. I think one of the things that uh, drives my own professional and personal practice is the piece around uh, psychological safety. I think it's something that we need to do more work on uh, for our staff to feel and experience that as part of their day to day um, being working for us as a, an organisation and that they saying this is a great place to be because I can contribute and not feel that there is a, a, a sense of something heavy is going to fall on me and that we they see and experience that from us as a senior leadership and it trickles down and I think we're hoping to, we're, well the intention is we're picking that up in all of the sessions and there's some key questions that we can ask as setting the context for when we come together. I, Elaine could I, could I suggest you and Vina have a conversation outside yeah. of the meeting with regard to how the psychological safety mm. element can be mm. woven in exactly as you've suggested and already intended but perhaps yeah. make it a bit more explicit if that could be a conversation would probably be of use there. Uh, John and then we'll conclude with Jamie. John. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Jill and Elaine, for this. I, I, I really welcome um, this approach. Um, for me, I think we just need to be conscious that we don't 
lose sight of the six areas of development. I think it's kind of lost in the detail with the actions we are taking, but there are six areas of development that we have identified through, through, through a process. Um, and for me, I think it's really helpful because every time I have a appraisal discussion with, with Sarah, uh, when we have a discussion about the board role, for example, I know exactly to put these six areas down and look at you know how I can um, develop in those areas. One of the things for me though, uh, we are having a lot of programs to help us with the six areas, but I think we need to be a bit more smarter in how we use those programs. So, so I would be interested in how we apply this in how we function as a board. An example would be we had a risk appetite session with the Good Governance Institute. So how does that translate into a revised BAF, for example, or how we see uh, how our risk appetite document is going to be going forward? So I think we just need to close the loop of not just having the training, but applying yeah. it in practice as well. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, yeah, John. Thanks. Jamie. Thank you. Thanks, Jill and Elaine. I think this is uh, very positive and I'm uh, very enthusiastic about it. Uh, like Janet, I'm also very keen on the complementary learning that we can, that isn't as yet specified yet, but is in development. I would stress the importance of learning from uh, other organisations and external learning to support how the organisation can retain a, an outward focus <clears throat> I think that's uh, really helpful and it, it was good to see that the exec are currently looking at opportunities for that. So it'd be good to see that at one of our development sessions. The other thing I'd like to see at one of our development sessions, Jill, is you mentioned the, the transactional training that we'll be having at development sessions, as we usually do, the more information based um, sessions on, for example, you mentioned safeguarding. I would I want to see uh, the health and well-being strategies and how we can learn from those. And there's a, a myriad of other ones that we would want to add add to it. Uh, I, I just I suppose question, Jill, on what stage um, we get to see the, the detail of that, of what that program would look like for the forthcoming year to sit alongside the developmental program that Elaine's been talking through. I actually had that in an earlier draft of the paper, Jamie, and then finished up taking it out to focus a bit more on the development. But I mean, that's something that I can circulate because, like I say, I already had it and then took it out. So, yeah, that's not a problem to circulate. OK, I, th I think I'm hearing general broad support for the programme as brought forward by Elaine, Jill, and I'm sure others have contributed um, as I said, I don't think it has to be static. We could do one thing and then that might develop into something else. But I think as a broad framework, can we have agreement with what is put in front of us in Jill's report today can be agreed by board as a way forward? Yes. Yep. Thank, yes, thank, thank you very you much are. indeed. And Elaine, thank you to you and whomever else has assisted in, in pulling this together. I know Jill and Sarah have both been involved. So thank, thank, thank you for that. OK, that takes us through to the end of our report. We, there are three reports there presented for our information. And then there are a couple of leases for us to note. Is there anything to be said on those, Jill, or is it just noting the fact that we've... Um, it, it's just noting um, that they have been signed. Um, I don't think there's anything... Uh, specific about them that I'd want to mention unless people have got questions. No, okay, thank you very much indeed, noted. And then to uh, note that uh, Dr. Amina Lopez Gaston has been appointed and looks like starting with us, which is which is always good news to see a new uh, consultant start with us. Um, which then takes us to have we seen or heard anything in today's meeting which makes us think that our board assurance framework needs to be amended in some way? Have we heard about any risks that we need to elevate? or any areas that need a bit more focus in the bath. I certainly haven't heard anything that we haven't captured already, but it's always worth checking. No? OK, thank you very much indeed. If I could sum up today's meeting as the first one within, within uh, this current financial year, there are three areas that I think as a board we need laser focus on, and they're very much in the QI world around the care of our, uh, um, our patients, workforce, 
how we're looking after our staff, retaining and recruiting them through the people plan, and then finance, agency spend, a laser focus on how we're going to pull those in, uh, pull that in to meet our financial targets as set out in Robert's paper. They're the three really high level strategic things that encompass a whole range of other things. But I think that's where we as a board need to retain that focus and will do through our development work, I think. Thank you for your forbearance today. Uh, we've gone a, a few minutes over, quarter of an hour, 20 minutes over, which is which is my fault in controlling the agenda. But we had some we had some important things to discuss. May I suggest we come back together for part two of our meeting at 1.30? Is that all OK by everybody? You have a separate link for that meeting. We come together at 1.30. Thank you very much indeed for today. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.